morning and welcome to Remembering the Legacy Oral History of Central States Communication Association. In 1931, here in the city of Detroit, the members of the National Association of Teachers of Speech, called NAS, decided that there was a need to have a centrally organized organization that would meet the needs of the various state uh, organizations of, of speech teachers. The western, southern, and eastern regions already had associations, but there was deemed to be really no need for a central association because so much of the leadership from the national association came from the central states. But at that time, NATS decided that there would be an opportunity to have a representative from each of the regional associations on the main board. And since Central did not have a regional association, the real stimulus for organizing the Central States Communication Association was so that there would be formalized representation on the board. This is only part of a very rich legacy that has produced over the years from the institutions in the Central area literally thousands of PhDs. PhDs who are serving our country through um, the academic sphere from coast to coast and beyond and through applied areas as well. In order not to lose the richness of the history of our organization, the Executive Committee of Central States this year decided that we would start a remember, Remembering the Legacy project so that the vivid stories of those who have been in leadership positions of the organizations can be memorialized. Today we represent, among the five of us, four different decades of leadership in Central States. And we're going to have the opportunity of hearing from Professor Bose, who was executive director and president in the 60s, Will Lynn Kugel, who was a, the a president in the 70s, uh, Professor Anderson, who was executive director and president in the 70s, and Judith Trent, who was president in the 80s, who will be leading as, an, as a questioner for our other panelists to discover what are some of the rich memories that they have. Since we are videotaping this, I would ask that you hold your, your questions, and I'm sure that you will have several for our guests, until the end of the session. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Kent. Trent. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Professor I know. <laughs> you cannot expect deans to get everything right. <laughs> Well, I do have some questions for you, and I think that we'll begin with Professor Bose. And the first question is, what has been, in your opinion, and is the role of Central States Communication Association within the communication discipline? Uh, does it have some uniqueness from other disciplinary associations in your mind? That's a very good question, <clears throat> and I'm not sure that I have a uh, a very good answer to that. Um, <clears throat> I've had to uh, uh, comb my 84, nearly 85-year-old brain uh, to sort out some of the historical facts about this association. Uh, my uh, association with it began in 1948 when I went to Oberlin under the tutelage of uh, J. Jeffrey Hour. <clears throat> And, uh, of course, as you all know, uh, Jeff was a fervent supporter and uh, preacher for our associations, and he preached the gospel effectively to Bob Gunderson and me, um, <clears throat> uh, urging us to join all the associations, the uh, regional, the state, and the uh, national association, and to attend all of the meetings. Now. Uh, my first uh, uh, acquaintance with Central States began in 1950 when Jeff loaded all of us, Bob Gunderson, me and our wives, into his car and we drove to Columbus for the, uh, my first uh, meeting of the Central States Speech Association. Uh, I think Paul Moore was the president at that time. Um, now, whether central states had a unique position uh, within the whole organization. I, I'm not sure that uh, that was necessarily true. Um, we were quite similar. In fact, I remember when uh, my name was placed in nomination for the uh, executive secretary 
uh, we weren't known as uh, directors in those days. We were just plain secretaries in those days. But in 1963, uh, someone called me and asked me if I would allow my name to be placed in nomination. And uh, I agreed to it, but I didn't even attend the convention. Uh, I went to Eastern, I think, because my wife and I wanted to catch up on the uh, uh, Broadway plays, and uh, also to, <laughs> I also wanted to check up on some of my uh, graduate colleagues who had gone to Eastern, and uh, consequently, I didn't even show up. Now, I was the last of the executive secretaries to be elected. Uh -huh. Now, that may say something about uh, my work as executive secretary. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, executive committee, it wasn't known as a board in those days either. It was the executive committee um, decided uh, at one of their meetings that uh, they could do a better job of selecting the executive secretary than the membership as a whole. So I was the last one to be elected. Now, whether central states, uh, and I've attended southern, I've never attended western, but it seems to me, it seemed to me in those early days that central states was well ahead of the others. That may have been true because the bulk of our membership was located in the central states. And uh, I know that as executive secretary, and uh, later as uh, vice president and uh, uh, president, many people said to me, I enjoy going to central states more than I enjoy going to the national convention because central states seems to uh, speak to our needs better than any of the other uh, associations. Uh, that that uh, I don't think quite answers your question, Judy, but that's the best that I can do well, at this a, point. It's a very good start. Thank you. Um, Professor Linkugel, would you answer this question? Let me begin, too, by saying the first Central States Convention I attended was in 1952, and I just calculated, and that's 48 years ago, and that's shocking to me. That <laughs> <laughs> long ago. That I've lasted quite a while, which comes right down to it. <laughs> Mine was 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, I remember very well a role that the Central States played for me then. I had one of my professors point out, there goes Kenneth Hans, you know, and there goes Professor McBurney and, and so on. It's how you identified the big names in the field, the textbook writers in the field. In those days, you know, the textbook writers were, were few. Now they uh, get their PhD one day and sign a contract for a textbook the next day or something like that. Those days, those were identifiable names. But I think that the association that, as a discipline has always been a, a big factor because it brought colleagues together, and I think it helps to form a feeling of a discipline. Uh, to me, anyway, the more I was involved with the central states, the more of a disciplinary perspective I think I had. And you see things beyond your own immediate university, your own, your own immediate graduate uh, program. And in this sense, I think the notion of uh, getting to meet colleagues and making contact with them has always been very, very important. Uh, but one, the second question here about the uniqueness of this uh -huh. discipline, uh, one thing has always been true, although Central States, I think, was the largest most of the time, and in some respects, maybe the most vibrant association, it always had to play second fiddle to some extent to the National Association, because the National Association's main strength came from the Central States region, which meant that there always have been people who don't attend Central States from major universities, major figures, because they identify with the National Association. And I, I, I used to attend Western once in a while, for example. I never felt that was true there, that the Western people, they identified with that association. It was their association, their regional association, which I always felt was a, a big advantage that they, they had over us. Thanks, Will. Professor Anderson? Yeah, I, I'm, I'll echo some of what was just said. Um, Certainly, Central States was the core of, of the discipline for a long period of time. It had the major graduate institutions, and it served a lot of core functions. For example, it used to be the time when the chairs of the Big Ten departments came together at the Central States meeting. And, for example, for my first job interviews after I got my PhD, came out of the meeting of the departmental chairs at Central States. 
Um, but Haberman came back and said, you're going to have an interview at Michigan, you're going to have an interview at Illinois, there's a job at Minnesota, it won't open this year. You know, that the, so it was kind of the days of the old boy network, to be very blunt about it, and that communication was a very vital part of what's happened in central states. It is true that people from central always identified very prominently with the national. But a lot of the major figures were always very loyal in attendance at central states. Marie Nichols, for example, yes. well into retirement, came to central mm -hmm. states. And very often, they would spotlight a program. The other thing I would say about central states is its journal, I think, was the strongest scholarly journal of the regionals for many years. It seemed to me that if you couldn't get in one of the national journals, central states was an outlet. The other thing that was true during our period of time was that people were still coming from the broad range of, of what was then the field. There were theater people and theater programs, and there was Oral and Terp. Uh, it was then called Rhythm Performance Studies. Uh, there were still some people from uh, the speech and hearing sciences area that were coming to the conventions. And uh, many of the departments were very diversified. There were speech pedagogy uh, panels and programs. And I think also it was a an effort, a very strong effort, which we'll probably talk about in response to later questions, to integrate and to work with high school teachers, a uh, very real feeling of responsibility of spreading the discipline down, of assisting the high schools. We had special committees that worked on things like getting it speech in the state certification requirements. Uh, so to help the high schools, there was a very real emphasis on textbooks and syllabi to help the high schools. Uh, that was more probably in the 50s than it was in the 60s. But, but it nevertheless was a prominent feature. So I would say it was a very um, uh, very powerful stimulus in a lot of respects. And, and reached out in many ways. In many, many ways in trying to reach all levels of the discipline and to advance the interest of the discipline. Okay, thank you. Well, could I just add to that? Absolutely. I, I felt very definitely we worked pretty hard. Now, I know when I was uh, president, which was in 69 and 70, at uh, reaching out to the high school associations and trying to have representation in each of the states and have a central states person, you know, who was sort of a spokesperson for the association in, in these different states. And Is that I thought when that, the state's advisory board became? I don't know when that came in, but it was a factor at that time, yes. I might say that um, uh, we did work with all the various groups, and I remember that as executive secretary, uh, or maybe it was as vice president, we finally gave up on speech and hearing. Yes. We, we used to have them as one of our uh, groups, and we wrote to them, and we worked with them, and tried to get them to uh, come to our meetings, but uh, finally we just gave up. They'd already had ASHA by that time. Yes. Right? Well, let's go on here. Uh, we have several other questions. Uh, the second of which is, if you could each describe the development of the association during the years that you were in leadership roles, in terms of memberships, in terms of the conventions that were planned, in terms of attendance at some conventions, in terms of projects that you had, um, in the overall, an, an overall sense of vitality of the association. Will, why don't we start with you this time? I'd like to pick up on something that was mentioned here okay. a little while ago. Uh, back at that time, in 1969-70, the discipline was still, in some respects, narrower than what it is today. And uh, I can't help but go hark back to 1952 because I went through that program very carefully. The diversity that was came in through, here was an oral interp program, here was a theater program, and so on. And then there was something called speech, and there was speech programs. It didn't have ORCOM or interpersonal, you know, or all these dimensions of the field that we have now, but they were speech or public address programs or rhetoric or something like that. And that, to a certain extent, was still true, I think, in 69 and 70. Uh, so there has been that kind of development since. But as far as the membership is concerned, I think, actually, we were pretty healthy at that time. Uh, the association had survived a journal crisis in the mid-50s. I know this because when I went to Kansas in 1956, Kim Giffen was in the process of saving and bailing out the Central States Journal. It was, had gone under, in effect, and he revitalized it. And, and I remember one time, can I ask him, can I have a copy? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can't afford it. <laughs> we got to save our money. We can't afford it. Uh, so we had survived that sort of thing, and I think by that time it was much more healthy. But it was always a discussion of meeting in Chicago every year. 
mm -hmm. because uh, in Chicago we had wonderful attendance and went to Indianapolis. I'm not picking on Indianapolis. Uh, the attendance would be way down, and so we would go back to Chicago. And for quite some time, I think we met every other year in, in, uh, in Chicago. Ken? Yeah. Um, membership was, was kind of interesting problem. As Will suggests, Chicago was kind of a key to a lot of things. The years we met in Chicago, the membership in the association was essentially 200 people larger than it was That's when right. we met in other cities. And so uh, when I was executive secretary and we had the old addressograph machine, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody remembers those. It had a set of metal plates and came down this very heavy thing and you whomp each one down, the plate <laughs> came through. Uh, Paul claims that gave him bursitis. I don't know. <laughs> Dude, but, those are jolters. You'll, you'll, well. you'll get an A in gesturing. But yeah. it was funny because uh, everybody in, in Freeze Building at Michigan and in the armory at Illinois knew when I was doing the journal run or letters to the, because this banging would echo. And I saved the insert plates because that saved the association. I think it was 32 cents plate or something like that. And by saving them every year, you did, you did save some money for the association. Uh, so there was, uh, there was that kind of, of effort. Uh, we worked hard at membership uh, for libraries. It was very important to get the journal placed in libraries. And we worked hard at getting department heads and others to request that to be done. The dues were structured in such a way that the sustaining members got their convention fees. And as a result of that, we would sign up a lot of sustaining members when they came to the convention because we would freeload them then for the convention and for a few dollars extra, they got the journal. And we sort of promoted membership right at that spot of the membership table. And it, it really worked uh, exceedingly well. Memberships varied. Um, uh, in December of, of 71, for example, the membership was uh, 1,763 people and libraries, of which 823 were sustaining members. Huh. So that gives you some sense of it. The library in that day, we had about 375 uh, library members. And the convention fee was a total of $4. <laughs> so that may give you something to, to kind of think about. But actually, during the period from the time I was executive secretary in 69 until I went out of the presidency about 75, membership hovered around 1,500, 1,600, 1,700, 1,800, and we tended to gain a little bit each year. We tended to move up on that, and the library subscriptions tended to move up as well. Certainly in those years, then, Central was the largest of the regionals. I believe that to be the yeah. case, by far. Paul, what would you like to add to that? Well, uh, when I took over as executive secretary, Merrill Baker had uh, preceded me as executive secretary, and something happened to the <laughs> president at that time, and Merrill went from secretary to president, and I took over as executive secretary. When he gave me the checkbook for uh, Central States, and I paid for the first journal, we had less than $100 in the checkbook. It was really, uh, uh, we were just barely getting by. And as uh, has already been noted, uh, Merrill said to me, now, when we go to Chicago, we'll do all right, but when we go to Detroit or to Indianapolis, forget it, you're going to end up in the red. Well, um, uh, I recall that by the end of the period uh, when I was executive secretary, and uh, uh, Lauren Reed gives uh, Larry Clark and me credit for bringing the association back into the black, I was able to turn over uh, to the uh, to Larry Clark, not only a fairly fat checkbook, but also two $1,000 bonds uh, CDs that were gathering interest. So we were in much better shape um, um, economically yes. uh, when Larry Clark took over than uh, we had been up to that point. Part of the reason was that we did raise the dues. I don't remember what the dues were. You say, what were the dues? For well, I, in 60, I don't know back in those days. In 69, uh, library and basic memberships were $6. Undergraduates were three fifty. dollars Sustaining was $10. And the conference fee, of course, was included in the $10. Well, as a result of uh, the slim checkbook that I received from uh, Merrill Baker, I recommended to the executive council that they raise the dues, which they did. And uh, as a result, uh, we managed to end up with uh, a good deal more money uh, finally at the end of that period. But uh, Central States, uh, membership at that time, I had about uh, 1,500 plates and uh, used that 
giant monstrous <laughs> addressograph, which not only gave me bursitis, but froze up both of my shoulders. I think from carrying it down the fire escape <clears throat> at Oberlin when I went to Ohio University because my car was parked closer to the fire escape than it was to the front door. And uh, I did manage, oh, I had to carry it up to the third floor of the speech building at, a, at Ohio University too, so that uh, added to the problems. This could speak to the fact of, of the gender situation and the leadership <laughs> of Central State. <laughs> Either that or size must have been a factor. I mean, I don't think I could have done that, you know, with this establishing. Executive secretaries were male for a long period. <laughs> yes, <there>. yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, well, let's go on um, and get your opinions of during your years of leadership, what you think were the areas of greatest strength of the association, then what were some of the vexing problems? Uh, Ken, we'll start this one with you. Well, I think that, that's a difficult one to answer. And, and let me just spin out a little bit of my philosophy. <clears throat> In some ways, the executive secretary, executive director, is the most crucial officer oh, of the association. Absolutely. Because that's the person that's responsible for the service to the members in large part. And uh, if you give a lot of personal service, it seems to me you're likely to help the membership if you're, if you're sociable, you know, reaching out, that kind of thing. So one of the things I try to do is to place a lot of emphasis on being in contact with people. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of decisions that we needed to be made in that time. For example, the journal exchange had begun with Larry Clark when we were exchanging journals. And during my tenure, we actually began to form up the executive secretaries of the regional meeting with the national officer, Bill Work, and we finally worked out a complete journal exchange where everybody who was a sustaining member got the journal exchange. So one of the issues was to do that. I worked very hard on getting a combined SCA uh, directory combined with the regional memberships, and that actually came to pass uh, during that period of time. So the combined directory was made available. I should say we pushed hard at the issue of trying to get the state associations included as well, but that was always a very difficult problem and the cost factors and the, the mechanics of that mm -hmm. simply prevented that from coming into being. So I would say that there was an effort to integrate our work. Southern and Central worked out an oral agreement that our conventions would not conflict because we've lost members to each other, uh, attendance at the convention. And so that was never formalized and sometimes even to this day we in, in the absence of joint conventions, we sometimes conflicted. So I think there were efforts to kind of coordinate the work of the things, to link the states onto the national, to bring membership, national, regional, and local, and try to get almost an integrated membership uh, kind of thing. I did several surveys of trying to see how much overlap of membership there was, and that kind of thing. We were working very hard to identify people from community colleges and uh, from high schools, because then the uh, SCA Constitution came into effect after the 1969, 19, say, winter of 1969, I guess it was, brought in a new SCA constitution and put high school teachers and, and uh, community college people on the National Council and Legislative Assembly, but they were to be nominated by the regional associations because we knew who these people were and the National couldn't find them. So there were a lot of ways in which we were trying to work through uh, uniting people, unifying the association, bringing into being the journal exchange, the combined directory, working to, uh, you might say, integrate the discipline. This was at the same time that we were peeling off for the last time people from ASHA. Uh, theater people began to move out from it. Radio television people were not ever fully integrated. So there was a lot of change. And of course, we began to specialize much more. As Will said, we began to have small groups in their personal. We began within the field of, of public address and rhetoric to become a very, very much more diversified, very much more uh, segmented scholarly kind of, of entity. And that needed to be reflected in convention programming, in interest groups. A lot of that began to produce structural changes. Well. Yeah, I think Ken mentioned something which I think was one of the best things that ever happened, and I think it came out of Central States, and that was the journal exchange. I certainly don't take credit for that. I don't know whose idea it was, but it was a wonderful idea. Uh, you got all four journals if you paid your Central States membership. It was convenient, for one thing. You know, it, uh, you didn't have to send a, a check to all four associations if you wanted their, their journals. So I think that was a 
tremendous uh, thing that happened there at that time. Uh, what happened during my years of leadership? Uh, I don't. I can't remember any great positive things that happened. Uh, <laughs> other than I do remember at that time, uh, the year I got the program together. That's my most vivid memory when I was vice president. The programs were formed a little differently than what they are now. Uh, in a sense, it was a little bit more of the good old boy network in that as the vice president, you contacted uh, so-and-so who you knew at the University of Missouri and so-and-so at Purdue and asked, would you get two programs together? And then they would get two programs together for you. And that's how basically you, you did it. You know. But there was something that came out of that, though, that was more positive, I think, than what's happened in recent years. And that is, we still had professors on the program. We had faculty on, on the program. In fact, the bulk of I was going to go back. I couldn't find the program in those years. I was going to count uh, what percentage of the participants on the program were professors and what percentage were graduate students, uh, if I could have discerned that. Uh, it would have been kind of interesting, because uh, I fear that the uh, professors have mostly abdicated the idea of the convention program, presenting papers uh, uh, at the convention programs, on convention programs, and on, in terms of research that they have been doing. I'll confess right away that graduate students do the bulk of the research. Uh, and, and maybe that's why they're on convention programs nowadays. But all the same, though, I, I think one reason that we maybe have less attendance at sectional meetings is because you don't recognize the names very well. You don't have Gus Friedrich from Purdue uh, on speech ed or whatever, you know, uh, as, as an example of what I'm talking about. It always drew some people, I think, to the convention programs. And I think that started happening not too long after, uh, about 1970. I don't know if you can call that a vexing problem, but I think it's one of the things that's happened that has uh, changed things. Thank you. Uh, well, um, I might say, uh, Will, that uh, my first program that I planned, uh, it was sometime in the mid-50s, and uh, the um, vice president asked me if I would plan a program, and he urged me to get young scholars. Incidentally, uh, the new teacher award uh, in those early days was not the new teacher award, it was the young teachers <laughs> award. That's right, it was. And I remember that, uh, I think it was uh, Lionel Crocker who, uh, uh, and some others who urged us to form a young teachers award. I was initially opposed to that, in part because I was too old <laughs> by definition. <laughs> but uh, I remember this first program that I planned and, and they, uh, uh, the vice president said, now try to get some young scholars. So I decided I'd do a program on Irish oratory. I entitled it, They Kiss the Blarney Stone. <laughs> and uh, I uh, looked around for people who had done masters and doctoral dissertations in Irish oratory. And I came across a name that I didn't recognize, but he had done his uh, research on um, George Bernard Shaw. So I made a call to him and asked him if he would appear on the Central States program. Well, he wasn't sure that he should. He said, you probably would rather have some older, more mature scholar to do the paper. And uh, I said, no, we want young scholars. Well, he agreed to do it. His name was Robert Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in those days, he had a full head of blonde hair. <laughs> now, of course, in those days, I had a full head of brown hair. It was kind but, of a hairy panel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but um, I, I would agree uh, generally with uh, the gentleman that uh, uh, the programs that we planned, the programs that we planned were usually programs that included some of the senior professors in our uh, organization. Um, my major claim to fame as a program planner was that my program in 1968 was the best attended program that has ever been given at Central States. I remember that the night before the convention, um, a number of us went down to a hotel, or uh, went down to a, a steakhouse in Chicago. And uh, after dinner, uh, uh, my first wife, Mickey, and I uh, went out to the curb, and we flagged down a taxi and uh, said, uh, uh, can you take us to the LaSalle Hotel? 
and he said, well, I guess I can take you there. Uh, he was a black gentleman, and uh, we got into the car wondering what, why he was so curt with us, and after we had driven uh, not more than a mile, he said, well, they've just killed Reverend King. Well, of course, we were shocked and absolutely speechless. I had just done a, a book on the rhetoric of Christian socialism with uh, Martin Luther King's sermon in there, and I was certainly glad that I had received permission uh, to uh, publish that sermon. Well, we went back to the hotel. He said, I can take you to the LaSalle Hotel, but he said, I, 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 couldn't, uh, I couldn't take you out to Old Town. Well, when we got to the LaSalle Hotel, uh, the fires were beginning to spring up all over Chicago. And uh, uh, the, for the rest of the convention, we were literally locked in to the LaSalle Hotel. We couldn't go anywhere or do anything, so everyone had to attend my program. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, if I may tack on to that, I came close. Uh, when, in 1972, I was executive secretary. Uh, there was a major snowstorm on Friday. And I'm telling you, in Chicago, it blew. The wind howled. The windows in the hotel, Sheraton, Chicago, just north of the Chicago River, vibrated like mad. My wife was on the highway, and they finally had to abandon the car and get onto a train to get to Chicago. But because nobody could leave the hotel, not because there was a curfew, but because nobody chose to leave the hotel, attendance of the programs was marvelous. We ran out of chairs in many, many of the rooms for the panels. And everybody said how great this was. And that led to our trying an airport-style convention one year on the grounds of, well, if they can't be distracted by the city, they'll all come to the programs. <laughs> Unfortunately, since they couldn't be distracted by the, by the city, some of the people did not choose to come to the convention. And we learned that convention site and, and the choice of members of what they want to do is crucial in locating your convention. <laughs> We learned. Yeah. I always thought that the dumbest thing the National Association ever did was meet in Denver in August. <laughs> Everybody went to the mountains, you know. <laughs> Actually, that was uh, the convention right after I was elected secretary, uh, executive secretary, and I was confronted at that convention by, well, I didn't know much about I didn't have any idea what I was supposed to do as executive secretary. I'd just been elected. And suddenly I was confronted by this gentleman in the uh, halls of, uh, of the Denver uh, uh, Hotel. And he said, you're the executive secretary of Central States, aren't you? And I admitted that I was. And he said, well, now, uh, I'm the business manager of the LaSalle Hotel. And he said, uh, if you ever get out to Chicago, be sure to come and see me and let me show you our hotel. Well, I didn't know what was going on, but I said, well, maybe I will. Well, it turned out that the, that Thanksgiving, um, I was taking my family out to Rockford, Illinois, where my wife lived. And um, I called him up on the phone and said, uh, um, we're coming through Chicago. Oh, he said, be sure and stop. He said, we'll take care of you. Well, I said, I'm bringing the whole family. That's all right. He said, we'll take care of all of them. Come on in. So uh, we drove up in our beaten up old car and our uh, threadbare suitcases and walked into the LaSalle. We're ushered up into a suite that was twice as big as this room. It had flowers on the, on the, uh, uh, on the bar and, of course, the inevitable bottle of booze. <laughs> And uh, that was the time that my children, ages 3, uh, 10, and 13, began to appreciate their old man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. If, if we could, if, well, you want to add May something? I just add one You want to talk about the Who? booze or the no, sweet? No. <laughs> Whoever was not at the Central States Convention in Chicago in 1967, probably has no appreciation of the tension that existed when mm. the news of Martin Luther King's assassination came out. It know. was 68. 68, all right. Uh, well, I'm getting older. I have a hard time remembering <laughs> the exact years. Uh, the tension was phenomenal. And I remember oh, I decided wow. I'd leave early. Oh. And so I left early the next morning. And the only time in my life have I ever asked a question like this, and I'm still embarrassed by it, but it actually ran through my mind. Should I try to get a cab with a black driver or with a white driver? Which would, I be the, which would I be the safest with? 
You know, I'm embarrassed to report that. Now ask me, which did I choose? I don't have a clue. I don't remember. But that ran through my mind. Let's change uh, tracks here a little because I'm curious also about your opinion of the association's uh, contribution to the discipline in terms of the scholarship. I mean, can you talk, you know, about the journal exchange and so on? And we've talked about, you've talked about the fact that the major PhD producing institutions were in the region. <clears throat> but really, what were the contributions of your estimation? Well, we'll, well, we'll start with you. Um, but what, what were some of the contributions of this association to the scholarship of the di discipline? Well, I really don't know of any direct uh, contributions other than, uh, of course, the papers presented at the, uh, at the convention uh, and people getting these papers ready, which always has some contribution uh, to scholarship. But the idea exchange would also, I think, uh, be a factor sometimes. And it ought to be maybe more of a factor than what sometimes has been, I think. Ken, do you want well, to? Well, obviously, uh, we, I mentioned the journal uh, earlier, and the journal was a very important outlet for a lot of scholarship. And if you go back, uh, you, you, you see some articles that were sometimes a little bit cutting edge that would be rejected by the editors of the national journals because uh, we don't, it wasn't quite, we don't print that. But well, we, we, you know, it was just that was too new or that was a little different. And so some of those things uh, then appeared in, in central states. I think also we used to do keynotes. Uh, Malithi Asante, then Art Smith, for example, keynoted at the Sherman Hotel and gave a very interesting talk. And I can remember uh, Art, Art as I knew him then now, Malithi, we're talking about, now, when you and I are conversing, notice how I position myself. And it's different than you would do it. And you don't want to have the direct eye confrontation. There was a lot of that. Ted Clevenger, 1972, keynoted the convention. Uh, later on, Marie Nichols gave what I think was her final valedictory address at a central states convention here in Detroit. So a lot of these scholars did that. And the spotlight programs, I mean, when you talk about pulling together the community, everybody came and everybody could understand and participate in that dialogue. So I think there was an important kind of community building, unifying kind of building. And as we said earlier, I think there was a lot of exchange that happened in the corridors. There was time at the regional convention, unlike the national convention, to really talk with the people you needed to talk with, it seemed to me. There was less pressure, less hecticness of running to this meeting and to that meeting, to some other meeting. Uh, and as a result of that, there was a lot of interchange, a scholarly kind. I, you, you did talk about ideas. I can remember sitting various places and talking about things much more though so than I did at, at the National Convention. So I don't know how you quantify that. I don't know how you identify it, but it was there and it made a difference. We've lost a lot of that though. Uh, I keep joking uh, in recent years, where's the convention? I remember when I was in Indianapolis last time where I couldn't find the convention. I was in the convention hotel. Uh, I, I don't think there's as much uh, scholarly exchange. I, I don't think we have as many uh, prof top professors attend the convention. As, as we used to have, and that's particularly true of some departments where they never come from. Uh, I think we've lost a lot of that. One of the problems, I think, uh, with the, the current uh, setup is that we have so many programs, we have, we have two or three times as many programs as any of us ever planned, and consequently, the attendance at those programs is frequently uh, two or three people. And uh, many of the programs are graduate students and they're graduate student papers. And consequently, we don't have the same amount of, I would say, mature scholarship uh, that we had in the earlier period. Um, talking about the keynote speakers, uh, I had a very interesting experience on that. Usually the keynote speaker was selected by the president. Uh, the president tried to get the the keynote speaker. At least that was true in the early period. And uh, I think we had a lot of keynote speakers that came from outside the uh, association. For example, uh, when I was president, um, Larry Clark put a bug in my ear. Uh, Larry said, uh, you know, we've just elected a new senator here in Missouri. And he said, why don't we try to get him to be the keynote speaker when we're at meeting in St. Louis? And uh, so I uh, decided that I'd get on the phone and see if I could call this senator. 
And so I called Senator Thomas Eagleton, who uh, was the uh, momentary running mate for George McGovern, uh, later replaced by uh, Shriver, I believe. And uh, uh, so I wrote to him, and uh, I was surprised and pleased that he answered, yes, I will be glad to address your Central States Convention. Well, apparently he didn't write the letter um, because uh, uh, when I uh, paced the floor madly out in, in the lobby of the uh, Chase Park Plaza Hotel in St. Louis, looking at my watch and wondering whether our keynote speaker was ever going to arrive, finally, about five minutes before opening time, this man bounded out of his car and into the hotel, and I recognized him as Senator Eagleton. He said to me, what's this organization all about? And uh, where can I buy a pack of cigarettes? Well, I was able to tell him where to buy the cigarettes. <laughs> and, 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 then I, and then I tried to tell him something about the association. It's obvious that he had not made a speech tailor-made for uh, central states. Well, uh, Charlotte Lee... Uh, Incidentally, uh, that's another interesting story. Uh, um, I remember when and the executive secretary always had to uh, uh, put out the ballot and count the votes. And when Charlotte Lee, who was the second president, woman president, yes. another Charlotte had preceded Charlotte her, Charlotte Wells. Wells. But uh, when Charlotte Lee ran for president, um, uh, she um, uh, had as her opposition none other than my boss, Claude Kantner. <laughs> I had to send out the ballot and then count the ballots. <laughs> and of course, when they came in, uh, I was worried about who was going to win and what I was going to say to Claude Kantner, my boss, if he lost, which he did. And finally, when the votes all came in, and uh, it was very close, but uh, Claude came in second. So I went down to his office and I told him that it was a very close election, and you did very well. But I said, when the votes came in from Evanston and Cook County, you, <laughs> <laughs> you went down to defeat. Well, I think he was able to live with that. Well, uh, Charlotte Lee was president at the time that uh, Senator Eagleton uh, gave his keynote address, and so she wanted to introduce him. Uh, and she did. Uh, Senator Eagleton uh, had gone to and I think graduated from Northwestern. So uh, Charlotte thought perhaps she remembered having him in class. Uh, he confessed that he didn't remember. And I didn't, didn't think that was very politic of him. Uh, and, um, but he did give a good speech. He did talk on uh, communication. He talked about some of the problems with the mass media and so forth and uh, I thought did a very good job. But uh, I think that our keynote speakers today, our keynote speaker this year, I think was better than those that we got from the outside because I think they spoke more to our interests and to our needs than uh, speakers who came in from the outside. Thank you. Let's, let's switch uh, topics here just a bit and talk about this in more personal ways. Ken, what do you think, as you look back on your years with leadership in central states, what was it its importance for you, I mean, professionally, linkages that perhaps your years in leadership made for you within the discipline, within the academia, so on? Yeah, I have very mixed feelings as I reflect on that question, Judy. Uh, it began for me a tradition, I think, of service to the association and to the discipline. Uh, up until that time, I really thought of myself, you know, as I was going to grind out the articles and do, do this and this and this and, and work with the graduate students. And getting into the central states uh, kind of tapped into the old routine of the debate coach, getting ready a tournament, stuffing ballots, organizing the, the rush of a feeling of when you get the ballot results on in time. And I got caught up in kind of the, the notion of serving the membership and of getting more people into the association and of building the association and of watching the bottom line. For example, I inherited about a checkbook of about 18,000, Paul. Well, not, not in the checkbook. There were 12,000 yeah. CDs from Larry. Yeah. And I built on that. And I remember once reporting to the uh, Central States Group. Don Bryant was there. And I said, at the end of, the, of this period, we had a profit of. 
And Donald was very upset about this. He said, well, why do you talk about that as a profit? You should say a surplus. And I said, because I look at it as a profit, and I'm building the reserves of this association, damn it. And uh, so, so I, I think it really uh, it affects profoundly what you see as your role in the association. It clearly led to my being elected president of the central states. I mean, it was very automatic, almost name recognition. I mean, my, my name had been on everything for three years, for everybody's sake. <laughs> so, uh, and I, you know. And, and we got a, kind of a nice applause when they, you know, as, as executive secretaries do when they leave office. Uh, and uh, it, it led to the uh, service with NCA uh, in the uh, consortium that was talking about the journal exchanges. Uh, got to know Bill Work fairly well. Because I'd worked on the finances, I ended up on the finance board of the National Association. That led to the presidency there. So it really started me on a chain of professional offices in which I thought the goal was to serve. And I have to confess, I never really went into those offices with a statement of, this is my objective. I'm going to do this to the association. I'm going to move them here. I'm going to bring this into being. I really thought about, how do I empower the members of this association? How do I make the systems and the structures more effective, more, more, more? How do I oil, if you will, uh, the sort of thing? So I think I really have to say, the central states executive secretaryship and then the move through the officer ranks, just changed the kind of professional life I had very, very significantly. And it even, I think, affected the decision to go part-time into administration uh, in the dean's office, in the provost's office, et cetera, at Illinois. Because service was because such a it, habit. Yeah, and, and you, you learned how to manage things. And you also learned that sometimes you come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, and what you planned to do at 9 o'clock was not at all what you were going to do the rest of the day at all. And that ability to jump shift and to be able to hold a lot of stuff going at a time uh, without crashing under it became a very important kind of thing. And there are stresses. Yes. Well, well, let's continue with this in terms of talking about the linkages that central states leadership did for you. Well, I think as the question <clears throat> itself says, I think if anything, it made me more professional. I have never forgotten that I got a telephone call one day from Ray Nadeau from the University of Illinois asking me, uh, would I run for president of Central States? And I said, I, boy, I never thought of that before. I certainly don't have a platform to run on or anything like that. <laughs> and after talking about 10 minutes, I agreed to do that. And to my second surprise, I was elected. And then uh, a little anecdote, the first year, I think, uh, when you're vice president, you have to get the program together. And I met with Larry Clark. And Larry was a real wonderful executive secretary. <laughs> And uh, he spelled out everything I needed to do, and I wrote it on a yellow pad, and I got in a cab and to go somewhere else and paid the cab driver, and he drove off with my yellow pad. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was too proud to call Larry back and say, you got to do this all over again. So I tried to remember everything he told me. And I think I forgot, almost forgot something that was quite important because of that uh, fact. But uh, when I say it made me more professional, it got me not only conscious of our association, the National Association, uh, I've always been involved somewhat with state associations. I still am old time enough to believe that we should reach down to, to that level and get involved somewhat. But also it got me involved with university matters, which I feel the best about in many respects. I was chair of university governance and chair of our Senex and, and so on, because I think it uh, triggered a spark in me that uh, if you're going to be in a profession, you ought to be professional. And I always prided myself, and annually we had to, to turn in our annual report with three categories of teaching, research, and service. I always wanted to have something significant in every category. And in the category of service, I wanted to have something in professional associations, as well as our department, as well as the university. So I touched the different bases. And I think I really sprang from having been the president of Central States. It, it gave me an outlook and a perspective I would not have had otherwise. Interesting. Okay. And Paul? <clears throat> I certainly would agree with everything that has been said, with uh, one exception. Uh, Ken uh, uh, mentioned that he was very much interested in just scholarship and that sort of thing. But I recall that my one single outstanding contribution to the association came during a session with the officers uh, when they discussed a a successor for Larry Clark. And um, I, a young Turk of my acquaintance uh, had mentioned to me in an offhand conversation that uh, he would like to uh, become active in uh, professional associations. 
uh, well, I spent a summer with him at the University of Michigan uh, in 1963, and uh, I was genuinely pleased by his pleasant personality and, and his uh, scholarship. And so when uh, the successor for Larry Clark came up, I nominated the uh, candidate, and he won unanimously. And that candidate is sitting over here uh, Ken Anderson. So he, was, he wasn't that uninterested at that time in uh, professional, uh, in becoming uh, associated with our uh, uh, professional organizations. But uh, I had the same feeling when I was uh, elected executive secretary, as I've indicated, I had very little idea of what uh, went on in the associations. Uh, I recall that um, I did become active in the association, due in part to Jeff Hours' urging. And in 1951, I managed to put together a paper uh, for uh, central states in Milwaukee. Well, one of my colleagues uh, uh, in economics also had a convention in Milwaukee at that time. So we drove up together uh, in his car uh, with uh, a package of ginger snaps as our uh, uh, as our food on the way. Every time I would ask him uh, if we should stop for a bite to eat, he would say, "Have another ginger snap." <laughs> well, uh, I went to that convention. Later, he became the academic dean at Oberlin when I became executive secretary. So I went over and asked him uh, if he could help us out and uh, supply some assistance for us. Ginger snaps. <laughs> no, no, no. He was as frugal with uh, Oberlin's millions as he had been with ginger snaps. <laughs> and uh, I think he did allow us a part-time student secretary. That was it. Uh -huh. And uh, for the rest of the work, uh, I had to operate the monster and uh, uh, mail out all the uh, envelopes. I might I had a very uh, interesting and funny experience on the on the journals. I don't know whether the other executive secretary here ever had such an experience, but we had to package up the envelopes for Heath Merriweather. Um, many of you remember Heath Merriweather. He uh, published our journals at uh, uh, Columbia, Missouri, and he also published many of the uh, uh, National Association right. journals at that time. He was a, a remarkable gentleman. Uh, I met him a few times, and when you talked to him, it was nose to nose, eyeball to eyeball. He was right up close to you. And I understand that he would read proofs crossing the street in Columbia. Uh, they wondered how he managed to es escape. But I remember that we had to package up the envelopes after we had addressed them and sent them out to him. Well, one time I put the envelopes in a fairly flimsy box. Uh, we had to send them out usually in two packages, two or three packages, because there were about uh, 1,500 of them. And one of the boxes broke open. Well, the U.S. mail went right ahead and mailed out the empty envelopes. I received innumerable letters from my colleagues. Dear Paul, I enjoyed reading the envelope, but I had trouble reading the journal. But uh, certainly, this activity with central states was a um, profound experience for me, going from executive secretary to the officers. And uh, uh, I found it to be a, uh, a really profession and scholarly build for me. It is interesting that of the 23 executive directors or then executive secretaries, 16 have become president of this association. I don't know if that's true in the other regionals, but that has been uh, certainly true here. Could, could I just pick up on something, Judy? Uh, Paul mentioned Heath Merriweather, and I think that that's a name that too many people will forget. Yeah. Heath published the national journals. Yeah. Heath published our journals. He did it at an amazingly low cost. And when he stopped publishing and sold his business, Standard Printing Company, we ran into very severe budget deficits because the cost of printing with anybody else was so immense. So we really ran into tremendous problems. Now, we've gotten behind in publishing the journal. Because of that transition, we had to get a new uh, 
publisher, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a very real period of turmoil. But Heath Merriweather was a wonderful, wonderful editor. And I worked with him on a very various ways. And of course, one of the things I particularly appreciate about Heath was he knew that my name was spelled S-E-N, not S-O-N. Something <laughs> the program compilers here don't know. And so uh, Heath would always say, Ken, I caught these errors, and I hope you don't mind them. And he would correct spelling. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was one case in which I'm told Heath actually discovered that an article that was going to yeah. be printed in a national journal had previously appeared elsewhere and yeah. alerted the editor to that. I mean, Heath yeah. was an incredible keeper. If you talk about institutional memory, there was none better than Heath about the scholarship and the work of our association. Meticulous. I mean, the, the thought that the editor of the publisher would proofread this stuff yeah. carefully was just amazing. He could say something no one else could. He read all the articles in the field. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so we ought yeah. somehow to have a pylon or a cell or something that talks about the contribution of Heath Merriweather because it is a unique one in the history of the associations. Let's, Sorry for that side. No, that's fine. It's very interesting. Uh, let's switch here again. We'll start with you this time, Paul. I'm interested in knowing in your years of leadership um, in CSCA, what then was the relationship of this regional association to, to the other regionals, but particularly to the national association or even the international association? I don't think the International Association had been uh, uh, started. We had the, N, the, National, uh, the National Speech Communication Association that later became the International National Society Study of Communication, NSSC. Na national, right? yes. Uh, and that changed then to the International. But I think our relationship uh, with the other uh, uh, associations and with the National Association was very close. We've already emphasized that central states was central to our profession, both in numbers and in, um, I think, uh, uh, institutions of learning. Uh, we had the, the largest number of graduate schools, the largest number of uh, graduate uh, students. And, and uh, um, we've already mentioned uh, the uh, association with uh, the central or with the southern and the Western and Eastern in terms of journal distribution. Mm -hmm. That incidentally began, the discussion of that began way back mm -hmm. when I was executive secretary and went on through the years that I was uh, 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 an officer. And I think we even made the decision about the time that I was president to uh, have this journal distribution. But it was Larry Clark that really, uh, really worked it out. But I think our association has always been extremely close to all of the uh, other associations. And I was glad that we had a joint meeting with Southern uh, twice. Uh, and uh, it's too bad that we couldn't get together with, uh, with Eastern and um, perhaps even with Western. But uh, I, think it's been, uh, I think we've had a, a very close association with the National Association. Bill Work was always very kind. He always attended our conventions, and he would always say to me, I know he wasn't uh, being truthful, but he'd say, it's good to find out how to be an executive secretary. Uh, he, of course, was executive secretary for years of the National Association, and he was always at our convention, always working with us, and uh, working in any way he could do to help build our uh, our own uh, programs. Oh, thank you. Well, I don't have anything particular to add as far as the associations are concerned. Just one one thought, which maybe not quite on the topic, but uh, I've attended all the other regional conventions a time or two, and they they have a different feeling to them. Uh, the Southern Association I always thought it was a club of some kind. Uh, <laughs> perhaps the LSU Graduate Association. For, <laughs> uh, the Western Association was different in that they saw that as the top uh, banana. They, they, there was the, no, their, no, their association. There are actually people who belong in the Western don't belong to the National Association, quite in fact, a fair, fair number of them. And Central States was always, uh, the, for me, the, mo the least connected. Uh, uh, there was, it was hard to identify it, uh, what the feeling of Central States uh, was compared to those other uh, associations. 
Yeah, I'd just like to throw in a, a dating uh, issue here. It was in 1969 that actually uh, we began to do a lot of these kinds of associations. We got the commission and the Speech Communication Association came into being between the regional and the national. And That's the when I was president. Yeah, and the executive secretary was one of two people that served on that. And because I moved through the offices, I think I served on that for six, seven years uh, in a row. And it was kind of a, an interesting proposition. Uh, you know, we at the 69 convention, I think it was, we actually discussed the proposed SCA convention before the CONCON convention. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of interplay between those uh, groups. Uh, as Paul said, we had the uh, journal exchange with Western and Southern, and then we gradually brought in Eastern once they began to publish a real scholarly journal rather than simply living speech, which we thought not to be too appropriate. Uh, I would comment that, that one of the disadvantages of moving toward a more scholarly journal, and I don't remember what date it happened, we stopped publishing the minutes of the association. We stopped publishing news and notes from the states. There was a time when our journal had a news and notes column with an editor from each state who reported to an editor who edited the whole set. So you could find out what was going on in Iowa, what was going on in Nebraska, what was going on in Wisconsin. And if they didn't send in the columns, somebody got on the phone and called them. So there was information available, which becomes part of the historical record. And we published how many people came to the convention, what the memberships were, all of this kind of data. We stopped doing that. And all of a sudden, a lot of the history of our past is no longer accessible because we now are not putting those things out in any real form. So I think one of the things we ought to think about is programs like this and how do we protect and, and, and hold that heritage. May I just add one other oh, comment? Please do. When I was executive secretary, one of the jobs I had to do, and Paul Bills made this very clear to me, I had to go out and get a boutonniere for all the officers, <laughs> and I had to get corsages at least for the wife of the president because the wife had to host the coffee for wives. And we eventually, I think, got to call it a spouse's coffee the year before we killed it. <laughs> but I think it is indicative of the change of times that we thought it was important that we have a spouse's coffee hosted by the president of the association for the spouses that were accompanying their husband so you could plan shopping trips, so you could do this, you could do that. Notice the change. I'm saying this with, with some humor and, and irony, but also with a kind of warm remembrance of we have changed for the better, but we've lost the trace of memory of some of these old things. Who would think of buying a boutonniere anymore for the officers? I'd like to add one thing to that. Uh, when I took over as executive secretary, our welcome party featured a huge, huge cake and coffee and uh, non-alcoholic punch. That was it. That was our welcome party. And everyone lined up and got a piece of cake and a and a glass of punch or a, a cup of coffee. And that went on until Charlotte Lee was elected president. Uh, Charlotte Lee case. from Northwestern, from the uh, Evanston, the home of the WCTU, uh, Charlotte insisted that we ab uh, abolish the cake and the coffee and the punch and put in a, uh, a, a, a what do you call it, a no-host uh, a uh, cash bar, and uh, so we lost out on the, we no longer had cake, uh, coffee, and uh, punch. We now had a no-host uh, uh, bar. Well, I do remember one time after that there was cake, because for the 50th anniversary convention of Central States, I brought back the cake. Oh, all right. We did all have right. cake. Good. <laughs> Not the coffee, but we did have the cake. Good. Well, we have time for another question, and I'm anxious to get your... Uh, opinions about this, uh, and, and maybe we've heard some of this already, but what are, think about what were some of the most rewarding aspects or benefits of your stewardship for central states? I mean, uh, what has it kind of meant to you? And, 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 you know, it's been a while now since you have been in the leadership position in central states. And over those years, as you look back on those, were those rewarding years? I mean, have, how do you feel about them now? Will, you look like you were anxious to begin this. Yeah, I, I'd gladly do them over again. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Where's the uh, nominating committee? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the people, I, I always say life is people. And uh, 
the people I met, I wouldn't have gotten to know otherwise, you know, were phenomenal. Charlotte, the name of Charlotte Lee mm -hmm. brought back all kinds of memories. I remember Charlotte Lee conducting the executive board meetings until 2 and 3 in the morning. <laughs> I mean, the meetings went on. Uh, at that time, <laughs> we always met that late at night and clear into the morning with, with Charlotte as the uh, president. I wouldn't have known her, uh, never would have met her probably if I hadn't been uh, on the executive board of, uh, I don't have the advantage of having been the executive secretary. I, I don't miss uh, not having done that particularly. You uh, still could, well, we I understand. <laughs> you would miss it if you had done it. Probably. <laughs> but you have an advantage that I don't have in that respect, but that was the most rewarding thing for me. It, uh, to say the people I met. Uh -huh. I think uh, I think I would add to that 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 was the most rewarding thing. And in those days, I knew everyone at the convention. Now, of course, I come and I know five or six. Uh, <laughs> and knowing all these people, and of course, I made a few mistakes, a few mistakes as executive secretary. I would fail sometimes to write on the card that the individual had paid his dues. And consequently, when I came to the convention, uh, I would be out in the hallway uh, in front of the, the registration desk, and someone would come up to me and said, say, they say I haven't paid my dues. Look at this. And there I, they showed me the receipt I had written for them. And uh, of course, I got well acquainted with them that way. <laughs> uh, now, I also had a very interesting experience with a few of them. Uh, I did have a few bounce checks. Did you have any bounce checks? Uh, a very few. Very few. I think uh, I could count them on one hand, but all of them were very genuine, and I would write to them and say that I was sure that the bank had made some mistake and uh, that uh, their check had been returned to me, and immediately I'd get another check. But I do recall that uh, that taught me a lesson that uh, I said uh, that if the bank ever returned any one of my checks, no matter for what reason, that bank had my last business. Because I can still remember those individuals whose checks bounced, even though they bounced probably for a very good reason. I'll bet and, our current executive secretary has an experience with checks you didn't have, and it came from me. <laughs> uh, I wrote out a check for the uh, dinner on, on Thursday night, and I wrote down the wrong number. So I wrote void on this check and wrote out another one for the right number. Then I pulled the void out and put an envelope. Mailed <laughs> <laughs> it, it to the executive secretary. <laughs> but when I get here, I'm told, uh, would you kindly talk with us? We have a little problem here. As <laughs> far so check is concerned, you know. I couldn't believe it when I saw that. <laughs> Ken? Well, it is the people. It is the people, ultimately, and the feeling that you maybe in some kind of way made a contribution to people's participation in the discipline. They'll never know it. I mean, that, that's fine. But you have made a difference for them, and you've made a difference for, for the professional life. So that's a very, very warm memory. The other thing is the cascade of hundreds of little memories. My son running around uh, a hotel lobby and the suite with the, with, you know, and when I was president, we got to have uh, Harry Truman's suite at the Mulebach Hotel and the piano that Margaret played on. We had the console meeting in a room which was lined with copper plates with edgings of various things that Truman had signed in that space. But the big excitement was for everybody who came to my presidential party to run back and see the shower stall that was installed because they had all kinds of gold faucets coming out, creating these elaborate sprays, and like, a, like a vertical spa, I suppose. And it was the highlight of, of the entire <laughs> party. It was everybody drooping in to see that. Uh, it, it, there are so many rewards. Booking the hotels, uh, learning how the finances work, walking behind these gold-plated facades, and you walk back there, and there's all this ugly cinder block as you're going back to turn your cash into a cashier's check from the hotel. Uh, it, 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 it's a, it's, I, I think those things just are memories that are wonderful and warm, and I'd never have had them without the association. Well, thank you. Thank all three of you very much for these memories. Linda? I want to personally thank um, our panel in a very different way. As I was listening to some of the stories, they resonated because I was part of some of that. Paul, 
You may be interested to know that the first Central States I attended is when you were Executive Secretary in 1966, and I thank you very much for that wonderful program in Chicago in 68, because I did go to every program, because we did not go to the hotel. Um, Ken, I think I gave my first conference paper at Central States when you were the Executive Secretary, so thank you for organizing that. And Will, I want to thank you, because when I was serving as President, you gave the keynote address at that conference. Thank you. It was a wonderful keynote address. Although Arlie couldn't remember it yesterday, I remember it very clearly. <laughs> so um, I want to thank you for that. As way of documentation, since this is part of the archives, I do want to point out in a very formal way that Paul Boat served as the executive secretary from 1963 to 66, that Ken Anderson served as the executive director, uh, 1969. Still Oh, still secretary at that time, 1969 to 72. In terms of their presidencies, Paul was the 31st president, 1968-69. Will, the 32nd president, 1969-70. Ken, the 37th president, 1974-75. Judy, do you know what number you were? No, but I was uh, president... No, Gus was president for the 50th anniversary of the you association. Planned, you planned the, I the planned program. I planned the Gus was president. You were, pres you were the 44th president in 1981-82, and some things don't change. I, I remember people going into Judy's shower at that time, too. <laughs> <laughs> Judy is not here. <laughs> I wasn't at that party. Oh, you missed a good one. And I was, I was uh, very proud to serve as the 56th president in 1993-94. One of the members of our organization who has been very vital in helping us remember, um, as well he should since he was the second executive secretary in 1937-1939, is Lauren Reed, who could not be with us today. But those of you who were at the conference last year perhaps will remember the wonderful program where Lauren shared some of his memories, the same as our panelists did today. And I think it only fitting that we conclude this particular program by turning to uh, Lauren's words. Um, some of you may remember that he wrote um, a fanfare for 50 in celebration of the 50th uh, birthday of Central States. And I'm very pleased to see that Communication Studies, Volume 50, Spring 1999, Number 1, reprints that particular article. And I would refer that to you for um, an additional way of looking at the association. But I want to turn to Lauren's words as we close this particular panel today and also invite you next year to Cincinnati where the dialogue will be continued. Lauren says, we teach the art and science of communication without which the human race would be a sorry sight. We communicate our own ideas and feelings in situations like conversation, discussion, and public speaking. We communicate the ideas and feelings of others in situations like acting the reading of and the reading of literature. Our discipline involves teaching people to do these things as well. Our research takes place in the classroom, the library, the laboratory, the studio, the clinic, the theater, the highways, and the byways. Our professional associations help us to share our experiences and to learn from one another. Somewhere around a corner, is a vision of greatness. People will continue to come along to help us as a discipline and as an association to share it. Please join me in thanking our panel for sharing some of their memories today.